We're starting uh, the Sefer Vayikro, known as Torah's Kohanim, the laws which pertain to Kohanim, because they're the only ones who are qualified to officiate in the Mishkan or in the Beis Amigdosh in the temple. So we, we speak about the types of offerings, sacrifices, which qualify, which don't qualify, the species and even the species, in what state do they qualify? If it's blemished, does it qualify? And which Kohen qualifies? If he himself is a blemished Kohen, does not he cannot officiate? The family members, do they, the women, are they permitted to partake of the sacrificial meat? Depends on what the sacrifice is. Certain yes, certain not. This is what's discussed in this, this book, in the Sefer Vayikro. The Torah tells us, Vayikro el Moshe, God calls to Moshe, Vayidaber Hashem elog me'omeid. And God spoke to him from the communion tent, from Mol Moed. I mean, the word Elof seems to be superfluous. The Torah could have said God called to Moshe and he spoke from Mol Moed. He spoke to him. What's the Elof? So Rashi cites the Midrash. Lamaitis Aaron. This comes, when God speaks to Moshe, it's come to exclude Aaron, which means God never directly communicated anything directly to Aaron. It was to Moshe to convey to Aaron, but it was never to Aaron himself. Although we find 13 locations in the Torah where the Torah tells us, So according to that reading, it seems to be God speaks to Moshe and Aaron equally. 13 times it says, Vayadabar Hashem Moshe Vel Aaron Lamar spoke to both of them, but we have 13 other locations where the Torah clarifies that. It doesn't mean directly to Aaron, but it means to Moshe to communicate to Aaron. Why? Because in 13 locations it says, Elov, Lo, Ito, which indicates to him to indicate never to Aaron. Okay, that's the word. That, that is the significance of the Elof. Only Tim Nevitaro. So even when it says God spoke to Moshe and Aaron, it doesn't mean both of them simultaneously, but rather to Moshe to communicate it, to convey it to Aaron 13 times. Now, we always speak about the number 13. The numerical value of Echod is 13. The unity of God, that's Echod, is 13. The Jewish people, we have 13 tribes. 12 tribes received a portion of the land. The tribe of Levi did not receive a portion. That's the 13th tribe. So it's Echod. That is the commonality between, we reflect his unity. That's Echod. How many materials were needed to build the Mishkan? 13 materials were needed to build the Mishkan. How many attributes of mercy are there? 13 attributes of mercy. By saying, which were given to us by Hashem, God says, if you want to activate my mercy, you go and you supplicate me, supplicate me with these 13 attributes of mercy. 13. If you want to connect to the Echot, it's through the 13. 13 locations, it says, God spoke to Moshe and Aaron. And then, but it goes to qualify what that means, means Moshe to Aaron, because 13 other locations, it tells us to him specifically. To indicate the 13, which it seems to be to both of them, no, it's only to him. We find... God called to Moshe. 
What was the level of audibility of that voice? When God called to Moshe in from the communion tent, was it a whisper? Was it at only a level that was sufficient for Moshe to hear? That no one else should be privy to it? So Rashi cites the Midrash that the sound, the audibility, the decibels of the what Moshe heard was no less than was communicated at Sinai. When God spoke to 600,000 men above the age of 20, of 20 at Sinai, it was the same level of audibility communicated in the Mishkan to Moshe. That's what it was. So you'd say at Sinai, for every Jew to hear it, it had to have that level of audibility. But in the Mishkan, where he's only communicating to Moshe, what do you have to have that level of audibility? For what reason? The Ramban explains, the Achbaratis explains that the Mishkan itself is a replication of Sinai. We find certain elements in the Mishkan which really replicate Sinai. Just as Sinai was encircled with the Jewish people, the Mishkan is encircled with the vertical beams. Just as Sinai, you had God's presence, in the Mishkan you have God's presence. At Sinai, it says there was a fire billowing up from Sinai. The gold of the Holy of Holies, gold is the color of fire. That's a representation of the fire. So there are many representations in the Mishkan which reflect what Sinai was. So just as Sinai, God spoke at a, a level of audibility which was projected that 600,000 people could speak, could hear, identically in the Mishkan, it had to, it was that same level of audibility to Moshe. Now, why? I mean, he could have toned it down a little bit. Why was it? We find many allusions to this fact. And it was right at the beginning of the portion of Yisro. Yes, Yisro heard all that Hashem had done on behalf of Moshe and the Jewish people. It speaks about Moshe. I mean, Moshe was part of the Jewish people. So why does it identify Moshe as an individual and the Jewish people? So the Midrash tells us from here we learn that Moshe Yeshokal connected Israel. Moshe's dimension of being was the equivalent of the whole Jewish people combined. Moshe's soul, in terms of its capacity, was the capacity of the whole Jewish people. Therefore, it says, Moshe of Israel. Moshe was the only one who was qualified to take the Jewish people out of Egypt. Nobody else was qualified. Not even our own. Although Moshe at the burning bush, when he was told that he would be the redeemer to take the Jews out of Egypt, due to his humility, he says, why can't Aaron be the one? Because Aaron was his elder brother, and he felt he may be offending him, and therefore he came up with every reason that he should not be the one. That was his expression of humility. At the burning bush, Hashem says, no, it's only you, no one else. Now, what was the objective of redemption from Sinai? What was the purpose? That we should be free? You know, Lincoln freed the slaves. They no longer have masters. So what did what did they do now with their lives? They threw up the shackles of slavery. Okay, now what? That that's not the Sinai. That's not the redemption of Egypt story. We went mishibud lagula. We went from bondage to redemption. What we were redeemed from. So the Mishnah, the last Mishnah, Pekai Yobos tells us when Hashem gave us the Luchos, the tablets, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments were Chorus ala Luchos. They were etched onto the stone tablets. The word Chorus with the vowels is red Chorus. If you remove the vowels, the letters of Chorus are Chorus. Chorus means freedom. Eilucha ben Chorin. Who's the true free man? The person engages in Torah study. You're truly free. Why? Say people are slaves of their desires. That's what we're slaves of. What desires 
dictate people's lives? How do you break yourself from those shackles of desire? How do you take control of your life? To do what you should be doing. Not everything to be invested in yourself to satisfy that desire. So that the Talmud tells us a number of locations. I've created the evil inclination and I've created the Torah as the antidote. That's how we take control of our lives. It's cherus. So what was the objective of redemption from Egypt? What was Gula? That you would be qualified 50 days later after we left Egypt to receive the Torah at Sinai to become the Am Hashem, to become God's people, God's chosen people, to become the Goy Kadosh, the holy nation. That was the objective of creation, of, of redemption. It wasn't just to be freed. It was to be freed from one and enter at another phase, another dimension of purpose, which becoming God's people. That And that was the objective of creation. That there should be a Sinai event. That there should be a people that accept his mandate, which is the Torah, and live by it. And be dedicated to God. That's the objective. Who is meant to receive the, the Torah? The Jewish people. It was meant to be given to the Jewish people. Now, who is the equivalent of the Jewish people? Moshe. Moshe's soul, the dimension of his neshama, was the equivalent of all the Jews combined. So therefore, when God gave Moshe the Torah, why was he qualified? Because the dimension of his spirituality was the equivalent of the whole Jewish people. So if the objective of redemption was to receive the Torah at Sinai, the person who took us out of Egypt had to have that dimension, had to have that dimension of being. He had to take us to Sinai to be the conduit through which the Torah was given through him. Because Torah has to be given to the Jewish people. As a result of this, we're able to appreciate the moment when Moshe was returning to Egypt. And he hesitated and delayed circumcising his son. And a snake, a serpent comes and swallows him up from his feet till his waist and from his head down to his waist. And Zipporah's wife understood that his life was in jeopardy. She immediately takes a stone, a sharp stone. She circumcises her son. And she takes the foreskin, throws it at his feet. The snake goes away. She saved the life of Moshe. If Moshe would have been killed due to that moment, at that moment, the Jews would have never received the Torah at Sinai. The only person who had the qualifications to receive the Torah was only Moshe, because the Torah has to be given to the Jewish people. Moshe is the equivalent of the whole Jewish people. He was endowed with the special neshama from the time he was born, or from the time he was conceived. Therefore, the only one who was qualified to take us out of Egypt was only Moshe Rabbeinu. No one else. Now, we're beyond Sinai. We speak about we have a Mishkan because the Jews failed with the sin of the golden calf. This is the medium through which God dwells in our midst. God communicates with us in that, within that medium, which is the Mishkan. Moshe is the one who represents the Jewish people. To receive the Torah. What is the level of audibility of communication at Sinai that God communicated to the Jewish people? There was a certain level of audibility. When the Torah is communicated, it has to be communicated at that level to the Jewish people. And since Moshe is the Jewish people, as a result of that, the level of audibility is that level to communicate to the Jewish people because he is the Jewish people. As a result of this, when it says God spoke to Moshe and Aaron, meaning that if you read it literally, it means God communicated to directly to Aaron. Not possible. Because the only one who's qualified to receive the Torah, you have to be the equivalent of Jewish, the whole Jewish people. That's, that's not who Aaron was. Therefore, we have 13 other exclusions or limitations that tells us no. When it says to Moshe and Aaron, it doesn't mean to both of them simultaneously, but rather to Moshe to give over to Aaron. 
to convey Torah. Because the Torah itself could only be given through the entire Jewish people. And that's Moshe Rabbeinu. Therefore, when it says, Hashem al Moshe he spoke to Moshe and Aaron, it doesn't mean directly to Aaron, because Torah only assumes the status of Torah when it's given to the Jewish people, not to an individual. Not to the individual whatsoever. It's very interesting. The, there's a famous word in words of the Zohar, Yisrael v'raisa v'kutshubich v'chadu. The Jewish people, the Torah, and God are all inter, intertwined. What allows us, what is the catalyst that we're able to attach ourselves to God? It's the Torah. That's what it is. Otherwise, we're not able to. The Rabbah rules in... In the laws of Yisraeli Torah, if a Jew observes the Torah's entirety, except he doesn't identify as a member of the Jewish people. For instance, he observes the Shabbos, Tfilin, Tzitzis, Matz, everything, studies Torah. But he says the successes of the Jews are their successes, and his successes are his. The tragedies of the Jews are the Jews, but they're not his tragedies. He doesn't identify as part of Jewish people, although he lives as a devout Jew, or he takes on another label, and he believes in God. He has no share in the world to come. No share in the world to come. A person who cuts himself off from the community, he has no share in the world to come. The question is why, but he's devout. He's observing everything. He's being spiritualized through the mitzvahs. Why does not have sharing the world to come? If you notice throughout the Torah, whenever the Torah speaks about spiritual excision, which we refer to kores, he's cut off from God. It says, nefesh ahi mi Yisrael. That soul would be cut off from the Jewish people. Or it says, that soul would be cut off from its people. But if spiritual excision means you have no relationship with God, to so say, you're cut off from God. The world to come is a relation with God. You have no connection with God. But why does it always say, the soul will be cut off from its people or from the Jewish people? Why? The answer is exactly what we're saying. God only has a relationship with the Jewish people as a whole. He doesn't have a relationship with individuals. If as an individual, you identify as part of the whole, you're part of the whole. Therefore, we have a share in the world to come. But if you don't identify as part of the Jewish people and you're a loner and you want to have a relationship with God, there's no such thing. God has no relation with individuals. Only as an individual, if you're part of the whole. Moshe Rabbeinu, because he was the totality of the Jewish people, he was able to do the deal, so to say. He was able to receive the Torah on behalf of the whole Jewish people, because he was the Jewish people. When the communications came in the Mishkan, it was directly to him with the same level of audibility as was Sinai. Because when God communicates Torah to the Jewish people, it's at that level of audibility. Because Moshe is not an individual. He's the totality of the Jewish people. Not only because he's the agent, he's representing them, but in his essence he is that. For that reason. So we say, we speak about Echod. Moshe Rabbeinu was the most special Jew who ever walked the face of the earth. He was the most humble person who walked the face of the earth. Could you imagine if Moshe is the, is, is the equivalent of totality of Jewish people? And that's why he was qualified to receive the Torah. So we say, he's able to cleave totally to God. If Moshe Rabbeinu would have any trace of himself, you understand that means there's you and there's God. There's you and you, you have your neshama. Moshe Rabbeinu, there was no I am my neshama. I am my soul. Because Moshe Rabbeinu was negated to such a level of humility, he said, what am I? I am nothing. As a result of what was his totality? His totality was his soul, and his body was only to facilitate what the soul is meant to bring about.
the last midrash in the Torah speaks about the passing of Moshe, which is in the Torah itself. How Moshe passes away. And Moshe passes away, Al Hashem. What is Pi Hashem? Through the mouth of God, it was called Misas Nishika. It was the kiss of death. Every other human being, or most, pass away as a result of the angel of death. An angel was created, that the angel, that angel comes, takes the soul of a person. Aaron himself did not die as a result of the angel of death. God himself came and took the soul of Aaron. When Moshe made a witness Aaron's demise and he saw how Aaron passed, he wanted that only, only that way of expiring, no other way. God himself should come take the soul. This is the ultimate privilege. So the Midrash says, Moshe Rabbeinu was sitting in his tent and he was writing the, the words of Torah. And God sends the angel of death to Moshe to take his soul. Moshe Rabbeinu is riding his back is towards the entrance and he has a sense the angel of death came into his house, into his tent. Doesn't turn around and he just keeps riding. Turns around slowly stares the angel of death in the eye. The angel of death freezes. Can you imagine Moshe Rabbeinu gazing? What Moshe Rabbeinu is gazing, he freezes in, on the spot. And he says to the angel that, what do you want? He says, I came to take your soul. He says, I'm not coming. Disappear. I'm not coming. But he says, God sent me to take your soul. He says, tell God, I'm not coming. Okay, goes back, didn't succeed in his mission. Goes Moshe Rabbeinu, threw him out, as they say. But God, Hashem knows what's going to be. Moshe realizing that he's about to pass away, he starts praying. So Hashem gave an order that all the gates from earth to heaven should be sealed to prevent Moshe's tefillah to ascend to the throne of God. So all gates were sealed. The many gates from earth till the holy throne of God. Moshe Rabbeinu's tefillah was so powerful, it says it was like a cherif chado, it was like a battering ram, which had a sharp edge on it. It broke through every sealed door. The tefillah went straight up. You couldn't restrain that tefillah. That prayer ascended with a force which it could not be held back. So Hashem says, I'm covering myself. Hashem descends, and Hashem says, it's time to come. Moshe Rabbeinu says, no problem, it's time to come, I'm coming with you. And he, his soul leaves his body. And Moshe is the one, and God attends to the burial of Moshe, because nobody knows the burial location of Moshe, exactly where he's buried. Why did, Mo, why did God take his soul? What is Moshe? Moshe is not no more. It's not a trace of himself. Moshe's soul is the equivalent of the Jewish people. That's the dimension of his soul. He is the equivalent of Echod. He en en encompasses the whole Jewish people, all 13 nations, all 13 tribes. So who comes to take his soul? The Echod. He is Echod. God is Echod. He comes and takes Moshe's soul. Anything less than that is not appropriate or not doesn't reflect who Moshe is. Therefore, God comes and takes his soul. This is a love. That's why the Torah can only be given to him. The Talmud tells us, based on a verse, a Novi Rashoy Lachadish Dover. If a Novi comes, a prophet, a proven prophet, and he comes and tells you, wants to introduce something which was not given through Moshe Rabbeinu. At Sinai, he's a false prophet. He's a false prophet. Although he was a, a true prophet until this, the moment he tries to communicate anything which was not communicated by Moshe Rabbeinu, he's a false prophet. Why is a false prophet? Because again, because the Torah itself can only be given to the Jewish people. 
And if Moshe Rabbeinu is the equivalent of that, and it didn't come to him, it couldn't have come to anybody else. So where did this prophet come up with this? You know what the answer is? It's something which he contrived and concocted himself. Therefore, that's a confirmation. He's a false prophet for that reason. Because everything has to emanate from Moshe Rabbeinu. We find that Korach and his community tried to usurp Moshe's authority. And Korach's claim was that Moshe Rabbeinu, many of the laws were all nepotism. He created it only to accompany himself and his family. What happens? Ultimately, at show, show, showdown time, the earth opens its mouth. Korach and his community are swallowed into the ground. The ground closes, it's over. God had the last word. Moshe is the authentic representation, representative of God, and Korach was in the wrong. Proven, God performed a miracle. He was swallowed up by the ground. He disappeared. Now, the Gemara tells us of a story. There was this great rabbi of the Talmud who was traveling, and an Arab approaches him, and he says to the great rabbi, there's something unusual in the desert. I want to show it to you. Would you come with me? He says, okay, not a problem. So they both get on the horses. They ride out to the desert. And in the desert floor, there's a fissure in the floor. And there's smoke coming out of the ground where, where the ground parted, separated. And the Arab takes a, his spear, takes a clump of fleece at the tip of the spear, puts it into where the smoke is coming out of, pulls it up, it's charred. That's how hot it was. Then he says to the rabbi, put your ear to the ground. I hear something very unusual. Maybe you'll understand what it's about. He puts his ear to the ground and he hears multiple people chanting, Moshe MS, Betoroso MS. Moshe is true and his Torah is true. And we are liars. And that it's being chanted over and over and over again. Who's this? This is Korach and his community in hell, burning, and they're declaring continuously, Moshe Ebes, Torah Semes. Moshe is true, his Torah is true. And we're liars. Because the only one who's qualified to receive the Torah and to disseminate the Torah and from its origin that's only Moshe Rabbeinu. Because again, because he's the Echod. He represents the Echod. We find that Yosef adjured his brothers that when they leave Egypt, they should take his remains with him. With them. So the Torah tells us that Moshe Rabbeinu, rather than borrowing the gold and silver from the Egyptians, he was looking for the remains of Moshe, of Yosef, and finally located it. So there's a basic question. Because when Yosef adjured his brothers, they should take him out. He says, with you. Meaning each tribe took out its founding father. That means Ruvain took out Ruvain. Because all the tribes went to Egypt. They passed away in Egypt. They were buried there. But when they left, they exhumed them, and they took them to Canaan with them. And each tribe was responsible for its forefather. So if you have two tribes representing Yosef, Ephraim and Asher, Ephraim and Asher, they themselves are able to take, take out Moshe, take out Yosef. Why did he put this burden on the whole Jewish people? Right? It's an obvious question. As the other tribes, their their descendants are taking them out. Yosef has descendants, his descendants will take him out. So why did he make such an issue? You must. That's a prerequisite for redemption. You must take my remains with, with you. So we explained based on the on the Chazal that he says, you should take my remains out mizer. The numerical value of zer is 12. When the, Jew, when the brothers parted with Yosef and they sold him to slavery, they broke that unity. That unity has to be restored. Because that is the profile of Jewish people, 12 tribes. That's the base 
profile, 12 tribes. 13 is afterwards. But if that's the case, if you broke the Zer because you separated from me, it has to be restored. You have to prove to me that you want me reinstated as part of your home. Therefore, he put the burden on them. His children take him out. It's understood they'll take him out, his descendants, because they're, they're his descendants. But you, you have to go and show me that you're willing to sacrifice to take me out. And that's a restoration of the 12. So the obvious question is, they didn't. Moshe took him out. Moshe is a levy. So how do they meet the prerequisite for redemption when Moshe takes him out, not the rest of them? That's a question. So the Sephardo says, Moshe Rabbeinu being the king, he represents all the, the whole Jewish people. So therefore, therefore he, was, he met the prerequisite because he's the representative of all the 12 tribes. That's what the Sephardo explains in passing. But according to what we're saying now, Moshe Rabbeinu was more than, he was the totality of the Jewish people. Because his neshama was the equivalent of all the Jewish people. So Moshe took him out. It was the equivalent of the whole Jewish people taking him out. Not because he's representative, as the Sifardo says. It's true, he, he was the, the king, but he's more than that. He, in terms of who he was, he was the equivalent of all of them. Therefore, when he took out the remains, it was the equivalent of all the Jews took out the remains of Yosef for that reason. There's a negative commandment that we're not permitted to add to the Torah or to detract from the Torah. It's called Baltosif and Baltigra. You're not permitted to add, you're not permitted to detract. Detract, we understand. Well, you know, I only have 612 mitzvahs. No, no such thing. God says 613, not 612. But if you want to add, why not? It's a greater indication of dedication to God. Why can't you add to the Torah? But it says, Lo Yosef, you're not permitted to. It's a negative commandment. The Gemara gives an example. A Kohen, when he comes upon a, a Jewish congregation of 10 Jews, he's supposed to bless them. It's called Birchas Kohanim, the blessing of the Kohanim. The blessing of Kohanim is comprised of three verses, three blessings. What after the Kohen says, no, I'm a Kohen, I have special pedigree, I'll give him a fourth blessing. And he adds a fourth blessing. He's a violation of Baltosi. He's adding, he's altering the profile of the mitzvah. You cannot. It's three and not four. You can't add. Why not? What is a mitzvah? When we do a mitzvah, what do we say? Asher kiddushan of mitzvah God sanctified us with the mitzvahs. With which mitzvahs did he sanctify us? With the mitzvahs that are directly from him. The mitzvah is the medium through which we, we become sanctified. What about if we do the mitzvah ourselves? We create a new mitzvah and said, that's not from God. That's not godly. That's man-made. As a result of that, you're altering the Torah. Even the adding is altering. Because the Torah is this and it's not that. The Torah itself is the word of God. And only it's confirmed as that only if it comes from Moshe Rabbeinu. Anything you add is not that. It's something other than that. I'll give you an example. Person eats soup. And he has um, pieces of bread in the soup. Tiny little pieces of bread. Croutons. So somebody says he sees souping has croutons in it. So somebody takes stones, little rocks that look like croutons <laughs> to, the, to the soup. Person eats the soup, he starts breaking his teeth. <laughs> well, it looks like croutons. You understand? It's not croutons. Those are stones. Well, it's a mitzvah. I want to be more devout. It only has the ability to sanctify you if it's God-given. If it's man-made, it doesn't sanctify you. So you're trying to put forth something which has no relevance. You're adding to God's Torah. Because the only mitzvah which sanctifies you, it's only had to be received that was given by God and received by the Jewish people. 
What you're adding was not, therefore it's not classified as Torah. It has no relevance to sanctification. So we have a good question. So what about rabbinic laws? When we light the Hanukkah menorah, we say, we read the Megillah, which is also rabbinical. We say, we're sanctified. You know why? Because anything which is a fence to secure the Torah, that becomes an adjunct of the Torah. As a result of that, and, to, and God encourages that, to make fences. And we say, we are sanctified when we do the rabbinic mitzvah. Whether it's Megillah or it's lighting the menorah. But if you create a new mitzvah, it has no relevance to securing the Torah. It doesn't in any way connect. If it doesn't connect, you're violation. That's called adding. You're adding to the Torah. It's not called securing the Torah for that reason. Now, it's very interesting. Normally, whenever the Torah speaks about a mitzvah, especially in the, the book of Vayikro, it says ish. It speaks, let's say, marriage. Kikach ish isha. Or the male, but it says ish. Here it speaks about, it would say ish ki yakrif korban. A, ish means a man who brings a sacrifice. Here it doesn't say ish. It says odom. Odom ki yakrif korban. Why odom? When the Torah normally, the terminology uses is ish, the man who brings his sacrifice. Why does it refer to Adam? Adam means a human being, or it means Adam. So Rashi himself immediately mentions what the imagery says. What's the law if a bring, person brings a sacrifice and it's stolen property? He brings a prize bull that won the award in the county fair. Prize bull. bull. And you bring that it's not valid. Of course, that's called stolen property. So what's Adam? Just as when Adam was created, the first day of creation, he brought sacrifices. And all existence belonged to him because there's no one else other than himself. So just as when he brought the sacrifice, it was his and no one else's, if it's somebody else's other than yours, it's not valid. That's why the Torah uses the term Adam ki It has to be similar to Adam. Adam is referring to Adam. And if it's not, it's not valid. So I was thinking differently. When Adam was created, God called him Adam. Why was Adam called Adam? Because he's made of earth. The word in Hebrew, the word earth is Adama. Adama Luka, because he was made of earth. So if you made of earth, therefore you called Adam. So morale of Prague asks, but the domesticated, undomesticated animal, they were also made of earth. But one's called Behema, one's called Chayyim. Domesticated, undomesticated. But if you say the basis for the appellation is what you're made of, so as man is made for it, it's called Adam, so the animal should also be called Adam. So why is the animal called Behema or Chayyim? This is the morale of Prague. So morale of Prague says this beautiful word, which we've mentioned in the past. Now, what is Earth? What does Earth represent? Earth represents potential. If you leave the earth fallow, regardless of, of the richness of that soil, it produces nothing. But if you take advantage of its potential, and you cultivate it, and you plant it, and you fertilize it, all life grows out of the ground. So earth represents potential. What is a human being? When you're born into this existence, all you are is potential. Now the question is, how do you Invest your life. Your decisions. In what context are those decisions made? So man is Odo. Human being could advance himself to endless levels. Odo, what about a non-Jew, a Noahide? A Noahide cannot advance himself. The objective of a Ben Noah, a Noahide is, I give you a soul don't compromise the soul. After 120 years, or as long as you live, I want you to give back the same soul I gave you. That's all I'm asking. And that's why all the no-hide laws are negative commandments. When you tell a person, don't do something, why should you not do it? It's not in his best interest. Because by crossing that line and transgressing, the consequence is a diminishment. The non-Jew 
he cannot go beyond what he's given initially. His service of God is to be that custodian to return it as it was given to him. The Jew, it's much more than that. We have negative commandments, we have positive commandments. We have 248 positive commandments. That means in 248 areas, we're able to advance our spirituality. So that's, we, our classification is Odom, Atem Kriyam Odom. We have the potential. The non-Jew doesn't have that potential to advance his spirituality. That's the understanding. When did we assume the classification of Odom? When did we assume the classification of Odom at Sinai? When we became, we said Nasev Nishma, and we accepted the Torah, we became Odom. Because that's when the mitzvahs were given. We have relevance. There was an expansion of our soul. We, we were given a, a metamorphosis of our souls took place. Now we have relevance to advance. Odom forfeited that right when he ate of the tree of knowledge. He was, became stunted. Could not go beyond that point. We at Sinai, God removed those shackles from us as becoming his people. Therefore, the, through the Torah, we advance, we're, we're able to spiritualize ourselves. That's an advancement for that reason. That's Atem Kurim Odom. Odom Ki Akrim Kem Korban. The sacrifice was speaking in the Mishkan. It's only because you're Odom. Because you have a classification Odom, you have a relation with God. You have relevance to the world to come. A non Jew doesn't have relevance to the world to come. Kol Yisrael Yeshtem Chelk Lamabo. Every Jew has a portion in the world to come. God forbid a person could forfeit it. But when you're born, you're born as a member of the club because you were removed from that putrefied status of Odom and you assume the status of Odom. Therefore, we could have a relationship. Therefore, you can bring that sacrifice, which the non-Jew cannot bring the sacrifice. That's Odom Ki Akrev. Only because you became Odom, you became this renewed being of holiness. Therefore, and that through giving you the mitzvot, which I gave you, therefore, you can bring the carbon now. You can have that level of relationship through the sacrifice. The non-Jew doesn't have that. I think we'll stop here.